So I would like to welcome Chotima. So how I met Chotima and what just kind of energy that, that, drew, that brought me to her, that brought her here, is the medicine and medicine and how we heal and how we are sort of moving still through this, through this time with like all of this stuff happening, politics, like being a student and being like engaging and how are we, you know, using our space and our energy wisely. So I thought, you know, medicine, you know, music, so important for us to continue um, that healing. So I met Chotima in Oakland, um, the Bay Area, California. Um, we met at a community center called Quilombo, and we had also a garden happening too that was called Africa Town. And Africa Town in Oakland was inspired by the Africa Town here in Seattle. So unfortunately, Quilombo just recently got shut down. But um, we, that's me and her met there. And so it's like we, we meet in these spaces when we're continuing our legacies and we're continuing this actions. Like we still meet each other and we still like are kind of, you know, we're still connected and the medicine that keeps us connected to continue going and growing together as you know, to fight for justice and to get our justice. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, she's a great MC. You know, that's how I met her. It was like, oh, I wanna one day I can maybe write some poetry or some emceeing, you know, but this is Chotima and I'm excited for the workshop that she's gonna give. I haven't seen it yet, so I'm excited. Hello, everybody. Uh, can you hear me? Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. It's, it's really good to be here. It's my first time um, on this land. Uh, so first, I just want to um, acknowledge the Duwamish people, the Duwamish ancestors, uh, ancestras y ancestros of this land, uh, the plants, the rocks, uh, the waters, the animals, uh, and all the spirits that are in this land that have protected uh, the Duwamish people and that allow us to be here together uh, with this clean air and with this fresh water, um, it's because of them. So, um, uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me. I'm very happy to be here with you. Um, so this um, uh, space that we are creating together today is focused on the knowledge that I have gained um, through my grandmother, through sort of through the, the bloodline, but also through my sisters and my teachers. Um, and it's based on uh, different indigenous uh, methodologies of healing. Uh, so basically, um, medicina casera, right? Um, home medicine. Uh, and a lot of the concepts that we're gonna be looking at today are from teacher Estela Roman. Uh, she published a book called Nuestra Medicina that talks about um, these central concepts that we'll be discussing. Uh, so for those of you uh, that are studying Spanish or that are interested in Spanish or that may speak Spanish, uh, does anybody know what apapachando mean? Or apapachar? Anybody? So, yeah, to hug, yeah, 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 yeah. So let me get this started. Um, so uh, something that the sister was saying, you know, and the work that, uh, the freedom fighter, Dr. Uh, Martin Luther King did was decolonial work. What does it mean? It, it means to literally take away um, the different layers that have been imposed on our minds and on our bodies, right? And it, from my perspective, that means to, uh, to decolonize mean, means also to revitalize the indigenous practices. When we talk about indigeneity, as many of you know, um, all of us at one point were indigenous to some land to some place, right? Uh, so it means connecting back to that bone, that bone knowledge, that knowledge that's inside in your blood, that's coded, codified in your blood, that knowledge that comes from your grandparents, from your ancestors, from your elders. Um, and so apapachar, the reason that I wanted to start with this word, um, is, is, it's an indigenous uh, rooted word, it comes from Nahuatl, um, and it doesn't have a direct translation in other languages, although maybe 
I don't know, it might be that some of you might have one, and I'd be happy to know that it does have a cousin somewhere out there. But what it means is literally what it meant in Nahuatl was to soften with the fingers or to give affection. And uh, in Mexico, what we have um, gotten it to, to be understood by is to, to love with the soul, to love with the soul, not just with the body, right? But to love with the different levels of the, of the being, um, to caress the soul. And, it can, and it's an interesting word because um, it can be used as a verb, but it's also a noun. Uh, so it can mean um, it's something physical as well as emotional. So something that can be felt um, and something that um, is also can be heard, right? Can be, uh, can be sensed in, in a variety of ways. Uh, so it can mean, like the sister said, a hug, a kiss, um, a caress, or a healing gesture uh, for a wound, right? And we're going to be talking a lot about wounds today. Um, and then it, it can also mean to caress, to comfort, uh, to pamper, to give affection, to take care of someone else. So why is it that I started with this word, apapachándonos, right? Um, and I think that something um, that I do uh, in, in my, my classes and in the workshops and exchanges that I have is I, I want to think about the ways in which colonization affected the most intimate practices between each other. Um, so how did it affect uh, our idea and our practice of love. Anybody? I see somebody over here. I feel like you want to talk maybe. <laughs> maybe in a little bit. Um, anybody, how did, how did colonization affect our practice and our idea of love? Yes. And, and that could be looked at in terms of, of the construction of race or even the construction of gender, right? Um, within indigenous concepts and in, in, in different cultures across the world, there's recognized that there's more than two genders. There's genders for each of the directions and everything in between, right? Um, so that is definitely one way. Um, any other way that people want to share? Not yet? Okay, I want you to, to think about it and maybe you can talk to the person next to you. Um, I want to, you to think about how did it affect self-love? How did it affect uh, partner love, partnerships? Then parenting, how did col col ideas of colonial love affect parenting and communal love? So let's take um, like five minutes and please talk among each other because I think it's important that we have a, a dialogue. I'm not just gonna talk at you, okay? So if you could please take a moment and then we can share with each other.
and maybe we're wrapping up our conversations and getting ready to share. Can we all say, mmm? Can we say it one more time, mmm? Okay, that's yummy, because the conversation sounded good, sounded yummy. And I know y'all have something to say, so I know you're not gonna leave me by myself. So anybody that wants to share, maybe one on self-love, yes. And I'll come give you the mic too. Okay, uh, so on self-love, Having come from Africa, from we were colonized. So I think that's what we were talking about. So I think when we were colonized and we have to live under this oppressive uh, people that used to make us work like slaves in our country, in the, in the tea plantations and the coffee plantations that belong to us. They came and took everything. So I think uh, on self-love, uh, what I'd say that our ancestors felt they didn't feel like they were worth it, like there was no uh, self-worth or something like that. Oh, okay, I'm just a weak person who's being mistreated. So you don't take that time. You don't remember who you are as a human being and you don't see any value for yourself because you're being oppressed. I think that's what I think about that. Yeah, and I think that to, to add to your point, um, one of the mechanisms uh, was destruction and theft, right? And so we see these big collections and these museums of all these objects of all the people that they invaded and that they stole from, right? And but oftentimes we see, for example, in a lot of the Buddha statues, we see the hands taken away. Why? Because the hands actually symbolize something and in a lot of um, different African uh, sculptures, the noses are, are taken away, right? And Beyonce, JC talk about that, you know, you will not take off the nose of, of my pharaoh, right? And so this also um, adds to that, to precisely your point of what you're talking about, um, taking away that memory, or attempting, I would say, to take away the memory. Because um, within a lot of indigenous philosophies, uh, particularly the philosophy of um, the elder Malido Masome um, from Burkina Faso, he talks about the, the knowledge of the bones, right? The knowledge in the blood, right? Um, anything else that somebody wants to add, maybe perhaps on uh, partnerships or on self-love, yes. Um, for partnerships, I'm going to take more of like a marriage route, like, uh, like my sister here, I'm from Africa. And back in the day, we, um, I know they try to push this idea that there's gender equality like in African nations and African, but no, if you actually look in deep into the history, African men and women historically used to see themselves as equals. This idea of a man is superior to a woman was brought through colonialism and religion, which we did not have in our society. Everyone knew the, the role they had to play and they knew one without the other would crumble. So it wasn't about who is better than who. who it, so we, they all knew that they were essential. And also, we also had these um, polygamous marriages where you had one man who would marry uh, like four wives. And now it's looked down upon because of the ideas that the West is pushing. But if you go back to, if let's say we go and ask our grandmothers, our great grandmothers this, they didn't mind it because they saw those co-wives as their sisters, as like a team. And in certain societies, you'd have less men compared to women. And you know all these women want their lines and their generations to keep moving forward. And this is something that was villainized by uh, colonialism. And now you, see, like, you have this whole like, idea that it's bad. And what I usually tell most of the people is that our ancestors knew what they were doing. What we are doing today is based on a certain group of people. Our ancestors knew how to survive given the conditions that they were living in, 
and they knew exactly what we had, they were doing. So I feel like what we are doing now goes against, and we are the dumb ones now, for just basing our beliefs on a single group of people other than following back on what our people used to do. That, and, and I think um, from what you said, I, I, I think that something important to, to understand is also the complicity in, within the, the creation of patriarchy as a, as a modus operandi, right? To support um, the colonial projects uh, within African countries, uh, what are now Latin American countries and what will be now called, you know, Asian, Asian countries, right? Um, and so I think that even the creation of this idea of what it is to be a man, what it is to be a woman, what it is to be masculine, what it is to be feminine, this binary that limits um, the possibilities of our expressions as people, I think, is important to think about, and also um, the the you know one. Th it reminds me so much of something that I read in a book called Red Medicine by Patricia Gonzalez, and and she talks about uh, when uh, she looks at the writings of the Spaniards uh, that invaded uh, these lands, and they say you know one thing that they were so concerned about was the power of women, right? And they said we need to figure out how to displace them within the, the, the position in the community, right? And so I think that is a, a huge part that is detrimental, right, um, to, to the way. And, and furthermore, we also have to talk about the way in which the land was colonized, how that those same techniques were applied to women's bodies, right? Um, and so then you begin to have children, and, and I'm one of those descendants of, of rape, right? And of that violence, right? And then th those complications then with all of the colonial uh, impositions on our own self-love. So it creates um, a disharmony, right? And each of us within our community are uh, responsible for our part to maintain the harmony. We're not responsible for everybody's work, and that was something that was imposed on women. We're not responsible to fix and tend to everything. We're responsible for our own, but everybody is responsible equally, right? And so this created an unbalance. And so maybe to, to move along uh, and to think about how did ideas of uh, colonial love affect parenting? And we can even think about how does it affect uh, exchanges like this, right, with the position of the teacher and the students, because um, very much is, it, it, it is connected. Anybody that wants to share? How, how do you think that uh, ideas of colonial love affected uh, ideas of how we parent, uh, how we are uh, parents? Anybody? Yes, thank you. Hi. Uh, so, your question was, how does colonialism affect how we parent? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not a parent myself, but from seeing, from hearing the stories of <clears throat> my family, so my grandparents were uh, were in Taiwan when when Japan um, took over Taiwan, and um, my grandparents they had to learn Japanese, and. Um, they had to learn and speak Japanese and the, their entire education and their entire reflection of self was completely changed and they had to <coughs> also teach that to their kids um, at that time when, um, which, when Japan had t taken over Taiwan. And so I think it affects how the parents feel about their own self-worth and their own ethnic identity um, and other intersecting identities and then also, they pass that on to their kids and say, like, this is what you need to learn to survive mm -hmm. so, so, that, um, so that you can fit in into this new, this new dominance. Mm -hmm. Anybody else that would like to ask me? Are you passing the mic? Uh, for me, I understand it as uh, the way a parent brings up their child. Mm -hmm. So 
back in the day, if you look, I like giving an example with Africa, specifically Kenyan, because that's what I am. So um, I did not grow up when my mom was beating me, like, you know, spanking, not really spanking, but anyways. But my mother grew up when her mother would do that to her. You know, there's some sort of like punishment that is not accepted now. I have an example when a friend of mine, she's a mom, and the daughter, well, they live here in the United States, but the daughter like went to school and said, my mom punished me. And so it was a case, and the, and the social worker had to come and investigate. And she told them, you know, you won't, uh, I won't let this thing tell me how I can raise up my children because um, I was raised up that way. The way I'm, I was raised up is how I'm raising up my kids. So, and she actually told, told the social worker, well, you know, you can call my other daughters, ask them how I've raised them up. And because she was born here in America, is not, uh, that cannot be an excuse that I cannot raise up in the way that um, my parents raised me up. Because I believe that um, there are some things that are changing now with parenthood. I'm not saying beat up your children, but I definitely, if my child is making a mistake, I will surely beat them up. I mean, not like really beat them up, but I will punish them. So I think it has sort of changed things. Because even in terms of respect, nowadays children are being di very disrespectful. And I see that and I'm like, oh my God, I don't know what I will do to my children. I don't have any right now, but well, I will have some. But I am saying how I respect my mom and how she respects her mother, that, that is also different. There's some points that this, um, this colonialism, especially in terms of Af in Africa, how it has changed things. And there are things that you are supposed to do, like if your, your dad cannot serve his food, he has to be actually served food and brought that, but it's changing now. Oh, the dad can cook. It's also good, but it's also a way that it has affected uh, the parenting system, I believe. Yeah. Anybody else that would like to add? Yeah, and I will be there. No, I was just coming to the Oh, floor. okay. On the last thing when I heard that it doesn't mind on different people. Okay. On parenting, the first thing, I th uh, it comes to self-love. If you love yourself, then the next step is parenting. Like, as an example, like, when you get the babies for the parents, they have to make sure they love themselves. On that time, you have to use the upper mature because it comes from your soul, you have to love it. And I have to tell about the, all the women in the world, like I have seen on the Arab country or some Asian country, during that time, like more than like 30 or 40 years ago, if there was a kid, the girl kid was born on that time, they used to kill it because they want a uh, uh, male kid. Mm -hmm. That's not called a parenting. Mm -hmm. Parenting is like a responsibility. It's not about when they're gonna get born and you're gonna just show your parenting only that time, no. You have to do parenting until you're dead. Even in the now in the society, a lot of state, a lot of different countries, girls get molested. But the parents don't take action because they feel like, oh no, like I'm gonna be like on the society, I'm gonna be down. That's not called like parenting. They have to take parenting in all situations of the action. From your soul, from your heart. So I'm gonna say for men, as for the women, parenting comes together. Like they, they, the parenting should be deserved both of the situation. Not, about, not only about the man, not separate from the woman. So yeah. that's it. Uh, just real quick, um, we are doing live captioning for people who have hard of hearing, so we need, even though we the can mic. hear you fine, the person doing the captioning can't, so we need people to use the mic. Thank you for that. And uh, our sister over here, um, and then I'll, I'll talk a little. And then my frame of thinking was more um, the colonizers were from European countries, so it's more individualistic culture, so more of, you know, thinking about your own self. And a lot of the countries 
or across the world that were colonized, they started out being um, community culture. So everybody, you know, um, everyone grouped together, the whole it takes a village to raise a child thing. It was very true for a lot of um, countries that were colonized. And so that kind of took away our, us grouping together and raising our kids together as a team um, versus just being only the mom's job or only the father's job or who, uh, one person to raise however many kids you have. Remember and to question. Oh, thank you. Um, it's also th what happened to the um, for those of us that and for, you know just for people to think about what happened to those of us that come from colonized places. Um, what became of uh, birthing? It became look to look upon as a product, as a product. We need people to our to be laborers. That was the mentality of the colonizer. Right, so it was looked upon as, as we need more people to do this work for us, right? So there's a lot of trauma in that, right? And then I think uh, simultaneously the dynamics, the collective dynamics, like um, you have mentioned, were um, distorted, right, and were um, cut into pieces. And like the African proverb says, it takes a village to raise a child. Those types of mechanisms. Were, um, were challenged, right? Th those practices that we had held were challenged. Um, and it, we, and nowadays it's even looked down upon, right? It's looked down upon uh, if you are a certain age to live with your parents. Um, where in fact, we, we have always had a collectivity, right? So, um, and I think on another level, there was, uh, part of the mentality of the fear tactics that the colonizer utilized on oppressed peoples um, also seeped into our, our psyches. And so a lot of the parenting ends up being um, a, a punishment based, right? Instead of dialogue based, right? So I think that that is something else that we have to think about. And then that in turn affects the way that we understand communal love the love that we should have for each other as a community. Um, anybody that wants to add to that, to the theme of communal love? Anybody? I think that what, one of the first things that uh, a sister said over here um, was the creation of these uh, different categories, right? Um, and so to move right along with the, 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 um, the presentation, so colonization, in, in the perspective of a, of a person like myself, we, we think of it as a susto. So a susto doesn't necessarily have a translation either, but a susto, what are the symptoms of a susto? It's, it's, it's like fear, but it's not fear. It's like sh a mixture of fear and shock. So you, what, um, the, in the Western sort of medical term, what people call it uh, for, a specific people is called post-traumatic stress disorder, right? So that is the terminology that is utilized in the United States. But this idea of a shock, of a, of a big fear, we had for thousands of years before. We understood that. So colonization was a susto, right? And so what are the repercussions of having a susto over generations, right? If you're afraid, your body tenses, Right? What else does your body do when you're afraid? You tense. Mm -hmm. you, it's harder to digest. You're, you get, and so we have been in a flight or, f or fight mode for 527 years. Right? And so if we think about what is the repercussion of 527 years of generational susto, right? And, and although we were colonized in different ways, the same um, techniques were applied to our people, right? Plantations were here as they were in different African countries, as they were in different Latin American countries, right? Um, and so now we begin to know this. So something that I talk about a lot is bone knowledge and self-awareness. And this is really important and central in decolonizing. 
and in and in what I call apapachar, apapachar, and apapachar donos, right? To to love yourself with your soul and to love other people and love the work you do with your soul. And so we have to begin to talk about the 13, right? So in indigenous uh, cosmovision, 13 is a very important number. 13 is the 13 heirs of the soul, which we will talk about in a moment. The 13 heirs that affect each human being, right? To different extent, each one. Um, also the 13 dreams. In the cosmovision of the Mexica people, um, each time that you go to sleep, you are in the, in the dream world, in the spirit world. And in this place you have 13 dreams. You might only remember one, or maybe some of you are like, oh my God, that makes so much sense. I have so many dreams. It's the 13 levels of the dreams. And then uh, we have also the 13 cycle count. So you know, in the Western world that we are living in now, we count, oh, now is the new Gregorian year, right? Which they got this information from our calendar systems. Um, you know, even the Gregorian calendar is not just their own. It really came from indigenous knowledges. Um, but we, we think of life in 13, right? And we think of life also uh, in seven, in, in cycles of seven, right? If we look at it in cycles of 13, by the time that a, a young girl or a young boy is 13, they are becoming a little, a, a small adult, right? Sexually, they are developing, their womb is changing, right? 13 plus that, that's 26. That's, you are in this time in a different position in your life. And we keep adding those 13 year cycles, you know, up until 52, which in uh, Mexica uh, philosophy is when if, you're if you have done the right work, your community will acknowledge you as an elder at 52 years of age, right? And then we have, even in your body, you have 13 articulations. You have the articulation of your neck, your hips, the different doors within your body, right? That we have to awaken through different, that's why we love to dance, that's why we love to move our body. That's, and that's what colonization tried to do, is to keep us afraid to keep us in shock, to keep us still and stiff and cold, right? So we have to activate the body, we have to activate the, bo the bone knowledge, right? Um, and so these are the, the image of the articulations and the reason I want to show you this is also because these, these uh, points are very important um, to understand also the, this next part. So the 13 heirs of the soul is an indigenous concept, it's ancient, uh, most recently, it has been written about by uh, teacher Estela Roman. Uh, she's from Guerrero. And these are the 13 uh, heirs of the soul. So we have susto, um, fright, sadness, worry, anxiety, anger, shame, resentment, grief, envy, jealousy, guilt, fear, and egotism, right? And so what I want you to do is I want you to think about three heirs that you are ch being challenged by now. Okay, so think about it and maybe share with the person next to you and I will bring the list back, okay? So uh, another five minutes.
Okay. Thank you. I love that y'all are really active. It's, it's great. That is the only way. Um, okay. So anybody that would want to share, I know it's something that is uh, sensitive, so I'll go first. Um, within my family, I think, and, and being um, uh, a woman and being from Mexico, I think that there's a lot of shame. I think that there's a lot of shame of just being a woman, right? And then there's the, a lot of shame of being light-skinned because that means that we are the product of the rape, right? And then there's a lot of shame in being poor, right? Even though we are super creative and we figure things out, you know? The poverty actually be created like a pressure of creativity. Um, but for me personally, um, I have been working, one of the ones I've been working on is shame and, and, and talking to that air and to, to be able to, to not be controlled by it. Uh, anybody else would like to share? Um, I believe shame for me too. Can you hear me? Check, 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 check. Yeah, um, shame for me, I believe, um, like the shame of the things that I did when I was younger. Um, I'm definitely could like carry myself in a more upright way and um, didn't have a lot of a lot of like positive examples so like my examples was like the the rappers and the people in the ghetto and stuff like that so I believe that shame like well I could have did something different and I'm like shame like shame of shameful things like that and then resentment like this whole week even though like the killings and like the slavery have been so long so long ago it's still history though, so it still lives today. So resent me about that because it's like those people was helpless. You know what I mean? And still to this day we still are helpless in, in all types of ways. So yeah. And then my brother, he had a good point too, so I'm gonna let him share too. Hey, that's right. Um, I will say fear because when my dad told me these stories about my mother, my country in Somalia, and how they colonism effects in my country, I feel fear because there's no way that I can make help for those kind of communities and how I can help. And I feel sad because as a young, like there's no way that I can know where the problems come out as a colonism for my country. So that's what I feel. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. And I think something that I want to, before other people share, something that I want to ask you to think about is, if you think about one of these heirs that is really present, or has been present in your life, and maybe even in your family line, in your bloodline, I want you to think about, specifically for yourself, when is the first time you felt sad? When is the earliest time you felt guilty? And go back to that memory, and go back to that part of yourself and talk to that part and work through that. There's a way for us to work through these because the, these are essentially teachers. You know, and sometimes we become really angry at them. I would be so angry at my shame. Then I would just elevate the other air. So I think we, we have to have a dialogue with that because ultimately, um, Within indigenous philosophy, you know, there's, we f it functions like eggs, right? Um, you have your body, and it, your body has a spirit, and the spirit is so uniquely you. Nobody else has a spirit like you. And then you have your soul, which is uniquely eternal, connected to everything, right? But if you have so much air, so many airs inside you, your spirit and your soul don't have enough space. And sometimes if it happens in a traumatic event, in an accident, a little part of you might leave. They don't, it doesn't feel at home in your body, right? So you have to call back those parts. And that's the work of remembering. That's the work of decolonization. We have to call back. We have to remember. Okay, anybody else want to share? Yes. Because 
uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm from Africa. And my life in Africa would, would be what you guys would call privilege, you know? Like my mom works for the United Nations. I always have food on my table. I have a nice bed to sleep in. And just like how um, it's, it's like I, you live in this sheltered life where everything is going so okay and everything is perfect. You have television, you have a PlayStation and all this stuff. And then you walk out and your neighbor is struggling to keep like f a fire warm. And like you're seeing, I, I, I remember I used to go to this really expensive school. And sometimes on my way to school, I would see these small kids with like tattered like uniforms walking to the schools that they were going to, and their schools were terrible. And I, I used to feel guilt because I was like, what did I even do to deserve the life that I'm living? Like, I didn't work for it, I was born into this. And these are people who look like me, who are struggling. And I wake up in the morning and I don't even have to struggle for anything. So there's that sense of guilt, you know? And then there's the worry that I feel like I can, I, I'm, I'm given all the tools to maybe change, to work so that I can make their lives better. But then I'm worried that what if I can't make it? What if I can't end up achieving that? So there's always that like, constant worry at the back of my mind. Thank you for sharing. Um, I think to, to say something to that, I think um, what I would ask everybody here um, to think about is uh, what happens with this emotion, right, over time? And how does it affect different parts of your body? Like the heart, right? Uh, the liver, the kidneys, the stomach, the worry creating that um, acidity, that um, vile, right? Um, or the sadness, or the shame pushing your shoulders down, literally um, changing your physicality, internally and externally, right? So thinking about first acknowledging, right? Acknowledging uh, these errors. And then I think the second part is thinking, where is it in your body? Where do you see it uh, expressed? So I want you to think about that for Another five minutes, okay? Where do you see these errors expressed in your own body? And is there a pattern in your family, right? So another five minutes, um, and maybe if you can do it in, in pairs, or you, I, I, another thing that I would suggest is if you have um, a piece of paper drawing a small diagram of your body, or thinking about it even, okay? So five minutes.
Okay. And can we say, can we say, ah? One more time, one more time. Ah. You know, that's how we, in, in, in Spanish, we say, ah, when we understand something. Ah. That's, that is one way. Um, okay, so if people want to share, uh, maybe where in your body is this air expressed, right? Because when we think about um, indigenous medicine, we understand that it affects on three levels. On the mental level, which connects also to emotions, um, on a spiritual level, and on a physical level. And simultaneously, healing, you're healing um, those three parts of yourself as a, as a being, but as you're healing, you're affecting the dynamics in your, in your group, in your, that'd be in your family or your friend group. And that also changes, um, has repercussions in your ancestral line, right? Because sometimes you may be like, I have this sadness that I can't explain. <laughs> Is that what y'all were talking about? And it's like, it might not be yours, but you are the one that they chose to work through that, right? Do you want to talk about that a little bit? No? Okay. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, anybody that would like to share? Uh, yes? Um, so I, it took me a second to kind of think about it, but I noticed that I've had a sore throat the last like week or two, and it's just like I'm not getting sick, I'm not coughing, it's just kind of there, you know? Um, and one of the ones I circled for my heirs is a uh, shame and uh, I uh, putting the two together after talking with my my friends over here was that you know and I'm, I, I'm a yoga instructor and I believe in the chakras and you know maybe just feeling things in your body like they're trying to tell you something you know and I'm starting to think that this like feeling in my in my throat and in my neck might be being shameful to like share my truth and like the things that I've come to realize about myself that are important that I love about myself but like feeling shame from, you know, expectations of the world that it's not good enough or not what people want or to hear, you know? Um, and so I felt like that was cool to come to and to know that I should just let it go. <laughs> yeah, yeah and, and if we think also about it, what is here, you know? Physically is the thyroid, which uh, also is responsible for the hormo hormonal balance of the body. Um, in uh, Mexica philosophy, we think about it as the butterfly, right? Um, and so you have to be able, the butterfly has to be able to like transform so it can move its wings. Otherwise, it cannot do its job, right? And then you have a knot. And that knot can become cancer later. Or it can become phlegm. First is phlegm. First is just like a little ache. Then it's phlegm, right? And then is, it could be cancer later on if you don't work through that. Uh, yes, or here in the back. I feel I have the problem sadness, anger, and shame. I was just telling her, I love this country, but whatever is happening right now, like a lot of things. The example I'm gonna tell, uh, on my last event I told, on Louisville, 70% people are uneducated. Government are trying to build a wall on Mexico border. It doesn't make sense to me. Like honestly, you can put that money, there are a lot of people in the state, they're suffering. You should put that money on that part. As well as I feel shame and anger on the, the race, the way people treat it, as an example, I'm gonna tell everyone, uh, if we get a chance, just watch a documentary of Caliph Browder for juvenile justice. How that guy suffer a lot of problem on the, it shouldn't be suffer on that like that. It makes me also anger, shame, and as well as uh, sadness too. For that shame, like I decided myself as a human being, like. When I was watching the documentary, 
I could not stop my tears. It's important to let it out. It's important to let it out. And we're here, you're in a, you're in a good space. You're in the right space. Sorry. Uh, you don't have to apologize. I feel shame that I could not help that guy. That's why I decided myself that I'm gonna study on criminal justice. It doesn't matter what what location I'm gonna be uh, working for for the police officer. If my de department is fall, I'm gonna put him on the court. Anyone is wrong, I'm gonna put the justice system work on that time. So that's my I feel that's my calmness. So I keep the study and make me. It made me like come and work for it. Thank you very much. And and I can we give him a, a round of applause, the brother? Thank you for being brave and uh, radical, radically vulnerable. I want to remind us that these errors are are not problems, but challenges and and teachers, right? And I think you showed us two ways uh, to work through them. One is through releasing. Right, and there's a poet, her name's um, Nayira Wahid, I don't know if you know her. Uh, she wrote Salt, it's a great book, and she says, if you don't allow your own water to heal you, how can we connect, right? We have our own mechanism of water. If you cannot release your water to heal you, then, you know, and so I, I, I applaud you for being open and for allowing that to, to come out, right? Um, and on another level, I think that in connection to what the sister said earlier is uh, we might not have been able to be there on this occasion or you know when uh, Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated or uh, in all of the other injustices that have happened and that have created the history of, as we know it today. But we are present now and we see different things happen in different moments. It could be in the metro, it could be in your own house, right? It can be in a classroom. And what, what do we have to do? We have to activate the, the throat. We have to activate the words. We have to challenge that silence, right? So already you shared with us two communal remedies uh, of how to um, learn from these uh, teachers that we call the heirs. Anybody else that would like to share? Anybody else that, that feels compelled to share? Anybody? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for being open. Um, okay, so uh, she, she wanted to say something, but she won't. So it's okay. I can say for her. Hey, that's right. Give it up. Yeah, for me. single story that no, like American have about Africa, you know. So I remember last quarter my friend asked me, so where you come from? I was like, oh, I'm from Congo. And she told me, oh, what do you do to come here? I was like, I get a visa and come here. She was like, no, I'm asking, do you use the car, do you work or something like that? I was like, what? Do you think in Africa we don't have Africa? No, because in Congo, just like kill people, like people die every day and all this stuff. So it's just like the anger that I have, like people just have the, the single story, you know, the part of story and just like see Africa, see Congo as a bad country, you know, something like that. Yeah, I, and I think in, in what you just shared, um, that's another uh, remedy, right? Uh, storytelling. Uh, because um, I don't know if anybody here has read uh, Women Who Run With the Wolves by Clarissa Pincola Estes. Uh, she talks about how stories are medicine. So stories can be poison, right? And for example, the stories told by Trump or uh, certain th these types of stories of, of an Africa that is not existent, right? That is poison. Right? But we also have our own stories, and those are, that is medicine. So it's also, we are capable of activating our words to create that medicine and to share that medicine. 
You know, that, that's why oral tradition in a lot of our communities has always been so important and so central to us as a people. And, and to, and, and, you know, in the way that we respect elders, in the way that we respect the word, like hip hop, for example, right? Or now, you know, the development of trap, you know, like, but it comes from storytelling, it comes from, from articulating your experience, right? So that's another remedy. Um, in terms of, of um, how, how we would apply this, you know, to create collectivity, I would, I would want you to, to think about it in, the, in, a, in a multifaceted way. What would this collectivity of loving with the soul look like? What would it taste like? What would it feel like? What does it sound like? Right? And I want you to, to think about that one more time with the people around you. If you want and you're brave enough and you want to go talk to somebody else, I also encourage that. And then uh, we will close the discussion with uh, questions. Yeah, so another five minutes to, to think about how does applying this knowledge, cre can, how could it create collectivity? And how can it be expressed in a multifaceted way? Okay, can we say A? Can we say A? A? Beautiful, okay. Uh, anybody would like to share?
not spoken yet. Yeah? Anybody? Anybody? If not, I'm going to come and pick. I'm going to come and pick. Oh, OK. Somebody over here? I saw somebody that really want to talk over here. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. My name is Carmen. I actually work here on campus. I'm sticking here with Tanya, who also works here on campus. Um, I actually had a question before what this lasting collectivity would look like, feel like, what have you. I was wondering what lasting collectivity looked like. I think first we need to recognize what that looks, feels like for us internally before we can acknowledge or spread that to our families, our communities, and so on. Yeah. And I think, I think that's, a, that's a huge thing, you know, to think about um, how we work through the, those teachings, those challenges, um, will in turn affect the way that we socialize, that we share ourselves with the world, right? I see you over here. I know you have a lot to say. And you know, I'm only here for today. And I want to hear people's voices. Thank you. I was avoiding this today, uh, trying to talk, because I've been super emotional today. Uh, lots of te tears of joy and tears of love. Um, <laughs> That's good. Let it flow. Um, to me, lasting collectivity looks like me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm a woman of color, and I fully embrace that. Um, one of my heirs is guilt. Um, I'm from New Mexico, and I just moved here about a year and a half ago. So I'm working on two years being in the Pacific Northwest, a, a decision I made. Um, but my, my goal for myself was to find my voice. Um, so I'm using it right now. Um, hey. Hey, thank you. <laughs> um, and I, I have a really awesome friend of mine who uh, shared with me that, you know, vulnerability is bravery and that I am brave. Um, and so a, a lasting collective starts with you and with me. Um, I was raised Catholic and, you know, uh, a, a, a value of mine, a core value of mine is charity starts at home. And my parents really instilled loving each other, whether you're in my family or not, you are my brother, you are my sister, and that's how I view each and every one of you. Um, and you know, I don't have a lot of money, but I have a lot of love, and I have a lot of respect for people, and you know, I can only do what I can do, and hope to God and the universe that that will affect you to do nice things for others, and you know, show by example. Um, I just have a lot of love, and respect to give to people because we don't have enough of it. And it's part of that, that resentment, that anxiety, all of those negative feelings and stuff that was listed on the board there. Um, I use that as my fire to, to offset every single one of those things and to just you know compensate for all the ickiness in the world because there's enough of it and I'm not gonna contribute to any of those errors, and I'm going to work through mine. So, hey. thank you, thank you for being brave. I appreciate you. Somebody else? I know a lot of you. Y'all were talking so much. Come on now. Anybody else? Okay. <laughs> oh, look at that! So I was, sh I, okay. I was sharing with Sam earlier um, that for me, what lasting collectivity means that I can still be an individual within my community, in my community. Um, and for me, like what that looks like is my art is different, you know? 
the way I create is different. It's not gonna be the same as the next person. And what it looks like, or I, I would say, um, what it sounds like is me being able to share and articulate what I make and why I created this or what I felt when I was creating this, you know, and it's kind of like speaking that truth, right? And what it looks like, or I would say what it feels like, it feels free, it feels like I can be like autonomously me, you know, and not having this like, this voice or like this, um, this oppression, right, that's telling me like, you can't create that, you can't do that, you can't taste it that way, you can't make it that way, you know? It's like, for me, that's not what a lasting collectivity looks like. For me, for me, it looks like, you know, very, very free and it feels like liberating. It feels like the Africatown garden, you know? Like, it feels like fresh dirt, fresh earth. It smells like fresh earth, you know? And like, um, working together and you're working on your garden bed over there. I could come help you. You can come help me work on my garden bed over here. You know, that's to me what lasting collectivity like looks like to me. Mm -hmm. I was like, hey. Anybody else? Any of the men that have an intense sight that have been like talking to me with their eyes but haven't spoken yet? <laughs> Sometimes y'all be shy. No, nobody else? Oh, the sister, yeah. Thank you, thank you for waiting and, and letting other people also share. I appreciate that. Of course, of course. I wanna hear everyone else too. Um, I, I appreciate you touched on the vulnerability aspect because I think that is what lasting collectivity looks like is vulnerability like from everybody and lack of judgment on other people and on ourselves too. Because I think one thing that has happened with all this colonization is taking away our, our power and taking away our love for each other and you know, people lifting each other up instead of comparing and judging and you know, I'm better than you for this reason. Like no, we're both great for individual different reasons. Um, and you know, like women supporting women, men supporting women, women supporting men, like just more interacting between, you know, those who normally would push each other down because I feel like a lot of our country is built on competition and you have to work really hard to show your worth. Uh, I don't think that's really accurate. I think, you know, being soft and gentle and being a caretaker or, you know, sometimes just doing nothing is great too. Um, so just a lack of judgment and more vulnerability from people so we can just see each other more. Yeah. You know, in one way that in, in Mexico we say, I think, we actually say, yo siento que, I feel that. That is a way that we say, you know, uh, functioning with this brain, the stomach, right? That's the second brain. And it looks similar. It's a structure that looks similar, right? It has a lot of pathways and, um, yeah, and they're connected. They're connected to each other. Um, okay, so I feel like now is a good moment to open up uh, for questions. So I think that if you have that question that you're like, I just want to ask, but I don't know, but maybe I want to ask. If you have something specifically related to one air, um, or if you have something specifically related to something that was shared that you want some clarification or a little bit more information on, now is the time. Any questions? Yes. Thank you. Patience. Lasting collectivity looks like patience. <laughs> On the list of errors, there was both fear and fright, and I was wondering if you could differentiate between them. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, okay, so fear. Let's think about it. Fear. You could be, I could be afraid, you know, I got a bad grade, let's say, right? Let, let's say I'm a seven year old. Uh, Brenny, right? Myself and seven-year-old. And I got a bad grade. I am afraid of the whooping I'm going to get when I get home. <laughs> right? Now, um, fright. I was in two car accidents. That's fright. Something sudden. Something that happened quickly. Right? Um, and on a physical level. Now, susto, because there's actually three different types of fear. Susto goes even deeper, right? So you can even think about it as um, the different levels of the skin. Fear is like the little hairs, right? And when you're afraid, sometimes 
the little hairs stand up because they're sensing. Because our hair actually helps us to sense, right? When, when you're, uh, like, when you have fright, oh, maybe your body gets tense. You know, the temperature changes in your body. You feel some type of weight. When you have susto, it's almost like a paralyzation of us, of sorts, right? Um, and if it's not treated, it can really affect uh, the soul. And it can really, and, and it could be like this. The symptoms of susto are like this. Um, you don't quite feel your, like your, yourself. You don't have as much energy as before. The things that you love to do, you can't do them anymore. The food doesn't taste the same. And you keep thinking about something that happened in the past. That's because you had a susto and you stayed there. A part of your soul stayed there. Doesn't mean that you don't have your soul. The soul is very complex. A little part stayed there. Or it didn't feel comfortable to be inside your body because you yourself are not comfortable inside your body. Right? So those are the different ones. Thank you for that question. That's a great question. Any other question? And, and maybe to talk a little bit more about that, actually, because now I'm feeling it. My ancestors are like, no, girl, you need to tell them a little bit more. Um, <laughs> Um, with susto, we have different ways of treating fear, right? So, for example, let's say one level of fear is when a little girl, let's say there's a little girl, and she's your little cousin or your little um, niece, you know, and she was running and she was doing all these types of things, exploring the world, really excited, really the way we should act as humans, right? Something happens to us in the, in the educational system that fucks us up. Right? Um, and something happened, she did not see something on the floor, and boom, she falls. Right? She has, she has a little bit of fear. Right? She starts crying and crying. Something that we do for that, a little bit of something bitter. Something bitter brings you back to the body. So chocolate, bitter chocolate. And if you have plants, if you're into plants, uh, we call it rue or ruda. Those are good for fear. Now, if you have fright, you have to further activate the body, right? You have to bring back the body. So we do, uh, what we do for, for fright and for susto, we do uh, limpias, what we call uh, as limpias. And that's a whole other lecture. But, <laughs> but um, limpias, essentially what it is, it's a cleansing. And I want you to think, for those of you that have had the privilege of being in a village, of, of being in a rural place. You know, people have really bad misconceptions about the village, but the village is a clean place, extremely impeccable. The villages I visit in Mexico are clean. There's not one leaf in the patio. Everything is clean. Why? Because it maintains the harmony of the space, right? So always, 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 if you look at ancient uh, pre-colonial paintings or pre-colonial art of the Americas, you see women or femmes, right? Maybe they were a, a different gender. You see them with a, a broom, right? And then the broom got absorbed and colonized, and then it became the instrument of the, of the witch, right? right? But the broom is essential for cleaning, for taking out the energy, for recreating the space. So a huge part is cleaning, and that is also part of like this work. When we're working with these airs, we're cleaning ourselves. We're cleaning our mind, because the mind will play so many tricks on you. The mind will have you think all these crazy things, you know, because of the way it was conditioned. It's not the fault of the mind. It's replicating a pattern, and it's letting you know something. It's putting something on alert. Hey, pay attention to this. But at the same time, you know, the mind is so controlled by egotism. So you have to, you need a little bit of your ego, but you can't let the ego take the place of the soul. And that is the problem in Western culture, that the, the, the ego has displaced the soul, right? Any other question that you may have? Um, for example, something is telling me to, and maybe as we get to you, yeah, 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 I can share this one thing. Um, for some reason, it's telling me to tell you this, but when you have, 
when you have sadness, right, or what people call depression, um, something that we used to do in back in the day and still to this day is we uh, put chiles on the fire. Why? Because chemically, the, the compound in the chile, it activates, right? Um, spices activate, activate the stomach and activate the energy, right? If we look at it in energetically. And an active stomach and an active body is an active mind and a happy soul. So um, actually like putting chiles on the fire and smelling that helps with depression, helps with sadness. That's like one small trick. I won't be as intense this time. Um, I think I let it out. Um, I'm, I'm curious, do you have any, like, as the true librarian that I am, do you have any resources that you could um, maybe offer up, like, you know, I don't know, 101 level kind of stuff so we can start growing our minds and our yeah. hearts and our so souls? Yeah, so one of the books is that this one. It's called, the writer is Estela Roman. And the book is called uh, Our Medicine, Nuestra Medicina. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, it's in Spanish. So you have to learn Spanish to read it. Um, <laughs> or you have to have a Spanish bay, or a Spanish-speaking bay. Hey, we like, hey, will you translate this chapter for me? You know, maybe you take them out on dates and you get one chapter translated each day. Or you, are, or you just learn Spanish, you know? It's spoken in 22 countries, at least 22 countries. So, you know, it's spoken in a lot of places. Um, the, another book that I've mentioned is, so I, I, I am really influenced by these writers. Um, Estela Roman, um, Malidoma Patrice Somé, he is an elder from uh, Burkina Faso, from the Dagara people, and his book is called Ritual. It's from the 1990s, but it's a really good book. It's small and powerful. Um, another book, uh, Red Medicine, talks a lot about birth, birthing, the womb, the ceremony of birth, and even how that became traumatic and how that gave a lot of us heirs, right? Those of us that were born in a violent way, right? Um, or with a lot of obstruction, you know? Um, and then uh, I would also recommend uh, Women Who Run With The Wolves by Clarissa Pincola Estes. And if you want to get that list later, I'm, I'm going to be here, but those are some of them uh, that will help. Um, yes, and, and I think another one that is not a book per se is talking to if you are able to, right? Depending on the dynamics and what you need. But if you're able to talk to your elders, and that could be the ones in your bloodlines that have some sense, or, because there's some that, ooh, man, they just were, ooh, hella polluted. I love them, but from far away. Uh, boundaries are important. Or the elders that chose you, and you have chosen. Because those are, you know, we have all different types of family. We have blood family, we have chosen family. Um, so those, I, I think that's the foundation, the, the elders. And, and your own intuition, that's the, the foundation there. Like, do what your stomach is telling you to do, right? Um, another thing uh, that helps with, uh, with sadness is actually, and this sounds like a very simple thing, and my grandma would always tell me this. She was like, es que tú comes a deshoras, da, 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 you know? What it means is you, you need to eat at your hours, you know? It's so simple. It's so simple, but for some people can be so difficult. You, you know, it might be 1 p.m. and you haven't eaten anything. Maybe you haven't even had water, you know? Or you all you had is a bitter cup of coffee. How are you going to sustain your body like this? So eating at your hours, eating when you're hungry, paying attention to your bodily fluids. Letting your bodily fluids flow. Don't hold things in. If you have to go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom. You know, in the, it's, it's a weird thing, but the education system is so creepy because they're like, no, you cannot go to the bathroom. You have to hold it. You're five and you have to hold it. Or you're 21 and you have to hold it. Or you're 17, you have to hold it. No, 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 no. You have to let things flow out. Retaining fluids or retaining your bowel movements is also 
indicative of retaining emotions, right? And over the long term, it affects other parts of your stomach, other parts of your organ, and it can poison you, literally. Can cre you know, I mean, urinary infections, all types of things, you know? Or colon cancer even, like, to, if it gets to that level. But that means, like, releasing things when they need to be released. If you feel like you're burnt out and you need a break, don't keep burning yourself out. Take a break, you know? Don't put things, oh, I'll do it, I'll get to it, I'll get to it later, I'll, in the summer when I have more time, or oh, when that happens, in the next week, oh, in the weekend, or in that other night. No, 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 you're making an excuse. You have time for Instagram, you have time for your health, you know? Any other questions for anybody? Yes. The sister's coming to you. The sister's coming to you. Maybe raise your hand again. Thank you, brother. So my question was, um, I noticed that a lot of the 13 heirs, they were all negative things. And so I guess my question is, is there like another list or is there like a positive 13? Because um, I feel like if people are operating off all those things, that can't be good for the mental health or for, their, for society. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I would say, I would even say that they're not necessarily negative or positive. Okay. The, it's, a, it's a teacher, you know? And we might not like it, but it's, it's not necessarily, it's a reaction, right? It's a, it's a part of, of the processes. Now, the thing is not a lot, the thing is here. Um, learning from the teacher without thinking that you are that. Because I think something that ends up happening is people get attached. So they're like, oh, um, and then there, there's also consequences of um, the poisonous stories, right? For example, one of them is the angry black woman or the angry brown woman, right? Oh, they're just angry. And, and that is what it is. That is not what it is, right? So I think it is also is, more than anything is being in a dialogue, right? Because the, the positivity or the, or the other side of this would be um, living in an equilibrium with them, right? It's not necessarily that they're bad. It's how we deal with them that can create more negativity. Right? Does that answer it? A little bit? Yeah? Um, I think that's, that's one. That's one way. Any, anybody else have another question? We're good? Okay. So what I'm going to ask y'all to do now um, is I'm going to ask y'all, and this is going to be hard because I have to hold the mic, but um, I want you to go like this. Generate some good warmth. And then can you put your phone down? Did you have a phone? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I called you out. Okay, sorry. And then continue to generate that good energy. And I want to, I want to uh, ask you to hug yourself. So we're gonna do like this. the first hug you have had today? Maybe. I don't know. Give yourself a good hug. Right? And then another thing that I learned one more time. Let's do this again. And we're going to go like this. I learned this when I went to Ghana with my little students. We would go like this. Um, 
because I'm a musician, but you know, I think it was important the conversations we had. So I, 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 I'm happy that we shared that. Um, but we have this one. Uh, <laughs> Ella, 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 ella,